Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Come on in. Okay. Welcome to church. Welcome home, Jesse. You had a good trip. What was the highlight of Nashville and Florida? The warmth and the ocean. I wish we had an ocean here. There's not many places in North America you can get farther from an ocean than Crystal City. <laughs> but that's okay. Walt, that makes me so nervous. <laughs> can I help you? Did you used to be a waiter at Applebee's or what? My goodness. <laughs> My level of respect, Walt, just went up three notches. <laughs> All right. Uh, I shared last week we're kind of starting off Sunday school a little bit differently. Uh, we just want to take a little bit of time to be praying for uh, the needs in our church family. And so you can... Uh, James, you want to get the back door there? Or less, someone? Yeah. As we think about our church family and we think about people who are um, in need, facing difficult situations or just changes or whatever, we want to take some time to pray for these this morning. So who is there in our church family that you can think of that we should be praying for this week? Landon, MRI on Wednesday. Hey, others, Bernie. Yeah, he's had a tough road. Pray for Val. She's on a holiday retreat down in Wisconsin and Florida, and coming back soon, right? So pray for rest for her. I think Joanna's having surgery this week, right? Joanna Crothers is having a, some implant in her ear, whatever that is. So hopefully help her to hear a lot better. Any others? All right, then let's go to prayer. So, Father, we thank you for uh, this morning. We thank you. Uh, that we can be together here, and uh, we're thankful for good weather so far. And uh, yeah, we're thankful for our church family, Lord. We're thankful for uh, brothers and sisters that we can share life with and that we can share our concerns with, Lord. And so we want to bring those uh, before you who are on our hearts this morning, Lord. And um, yeah, so we think of uh, Landon and his upcoming MRI, Lord. And we just, um, yeah, we pray for your miraculous touch on his his body, Lord, that it would be a testimony of your goodness and your grace. And so we pray, Father, that, yeah, he would be a blessing uh, to those that he encounters on that trip as well, and just that you would continue to hold that whole family in your hands uh, through this time, Lord. We pray for Bernie. We pray for healing for him, Lord. We pray for wisdom for doctors and surgeons and openings and all of the things that need to happen, Lord, they are not beyond you. And so we thank you for Bernie. Uh, we love him, and we just pray your, your blessing on him today and your healing. Thank you for Val, and thank you for um, yeah time of rest that she could have, Lord, and, and visiting friends and, and spending time just in your creation. And we just pray for continued rest for her and safe travels as she comes home. And we pray for Joanna as she has a surgery this week as well. 
And yeah, we pray for um, skillful hands, Lord, for those surgeons um, to do this the best way that it can be done and that it could result in uh, easier, easier hearing for Joanna. And uh, yeah, so we pray a blessing on her and Dan as well, Lord. So we thank you for this morning and we pray uh, your blessing on our conversation in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to wrap up uh, this little series on the image of God. I guess it's a three-week uh, series. So what I want to do is I'll just kind of, in a few minutes, just quickly review what I talked about last week. And then if there's some thoughts or comments that have been stirring in your mind, we'll give you a little bit of space to share some of those. And then I've got lots, of, uh, lots more stuff to get through as well. So we'll see how far we get. We might not get it all done, but that's okay. We're going to wrap it up one way or the other. There we go. So these are, this is where we're starting, right? In Genesis 1, 26 to 28, um, looking at these passages, about what it means to be made in the image of God, male and female, created in His image. We talked about our bodies. Do, um, that Scripture doesn't necessarily speak about our bodies as being the image bearers. It's not that my body looks like God's body if God would ever have a body or be limited to a body but something much bigger than just our human bodies. We talked about uh, Jesus becoming flesh, which was a transition. He wasn't in a, a body uh, in his state of being with God. Um, and it was a change for Jesus to become a human body. So it's not necessarily that our human bodies are exactly the image bearers. Uh, we also talked about how we are distinct from the rest of creation and that uh, Genesis talks about humans in relation to the animals. And so there is a distinction between humans and animals, and we had a, a long conversation about some of that, how sometimes in our culture we humanize animals and dehumanize people in all sorts of ways. Um, we talked about the distinction that God uh, has in Genesis. There's a distinction between male and female that we need to continue to hold on to, and there's a distinction between human and animal. And so we had some conversations about that. Um, we talked about what it means to be made in the image of God and the, and the commands that come out of it. So one was, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, which is make more image bearers. Uh, a command for humanity as a whole, not every image bearer um, carries out that command, but as a whole, we do. And the other one, which is uh, the one that comes most directly out of us being made in God's image, it is so that God says, let's make people, humans, atoms, um, in our image so that they may rule. And we talked about what it doesn't mean to rule. It doesn't mean that we're in charge of this world and we get to do whatever we want. Rather, this is still God's world. Everything is his, um, but he has put us in a place to govern this world to be his representatives. Um, we talked about... Uh, the word image in Hebrew, this word is tselem, which is the same word that gets translated as an idol. And so we have, we have a strictly negative view of the word idol because mostly it's negative in the Old Testament. Um, but yet, when we're made in the image of God, we are made as his tselems, his representatives. And so an idol isn't actually that God, but it represents that God. And so that's sort of the same calling for us. We are not God, but we are called to represent God. So we looked at some of these statues in the ancient world of how these kings thought they were sort of half king, half god, and they represented their god. And so they set up these statues all over the place to say, this is where I'm in charge. So their model was some deity, some god, and then this god slash king who rules over the people. And God's way is we have God who makes all people intended to be his image bearers who rule over all creation. Um, so we saw this in Genesis. It begins with, we're made in his image so that we might rule. And then we flipped all the way over to uh, Revelation. And the way it ends is we're with God and we rule. We end up reigning and ruling forever and ever. So that's three, four minute summary of what we talked about um, last Sunday. So any things that have been stirring in your mind over the last week, <clears throat> Our minds are not stirred. They're just simmering. That's fine. 
um, then we'll carry on. We got lots to talk about this morning. Um, so we went to Genesis over here. I was got to start from your left to my right. Uh, we went to Genesis where it says we're going to rule. Then we went to Revelation. The end says we're going to end up ruling. So now let's go to the middle of our Bible, um, to the Psalms. We come to Psalm 8. Um, and this is what the psalmist says. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind or what is a mortal um, that you are mindful of them? Human beings, sons of Adam, that you care for them. So the psalmist is looking at the stars, the moon, the planets, this amazing universe that we're in, looking at all the beauty, beauty of that world and saying, God, why on earth would you care about this little 200-pound sack of bones and flesh? Why would you care? You've got Jupiter and Saturn and billions of stars. Why would you care about us? Really good question. He answers it this way. You have made them, that's us, a little lower than the angels. Now this is a difficult uh, verse to translate and all of our Bibles are, are doing different things here. So some of your Bibles say you made them a little lower than angels. Uh, some say a little lower than heavenly beings. And some say a little lower than God. And we could talk for a long time about the different ways those are translated. But we'll go with angels. Um, that's the way that Hebrews uses it when Hebrews quotes this verse. As human beings, God made us just a little lower than the angels. You've made them rulers over the works of your hand. You put everything under their feet. It goes on, all the flocks and herds, animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea. It's all that same Genesis language uh, again. There is nothing in all creation that is more godlike than a human being. We think of like the majesty of the universe and like the sun, which is, I don't know how big the sun is, a thousand times bigger than the earth of just burning fire and gas. That's amazing, but it's not as amazing as me. There's nothing in the universe that is more godlike than a human being. So we don't think of ourselves that way. We sometimes think of like, you know, an innocent little puppy, like, that's more like God than, than a human, right? Because humans are so fallen, we know how broken we are. But God put us in charge, not the, not the puppies. Um, so this, ver this psalm is really important. We have been crowned and made rulers. Um, which means that when we don't live up to that, it's even worse. Um, so we talk about the animal kingdom. How many of you have ever watched a cat eat a mouse? of you. I got to see it yesterday. I was pleased because um, <laughs> there was a mouse right outside our door and I heard all this kerfuffle and there was our cat doing his job. Um, and if you've watched it, it's not a pleasant experience for the mouse. Um, it is not usually over quickly. Um, cats will play and toy with that mouse and torture it, right? Dave's not and you've seen this and then they'll eat it and if your kids watch, it's they got to learn about this is nature, right? And you hear the bones crunch and all those things, right? When I look at my cat doing that, there's a part of me that's like, come on, buddy, why do you got to torture the poor mouse? That's only because I'm humanizing my cat because I'm thinking he should act like a human. But he's not a human. He's a cat. He is doing exactly what God created him to do. Now, if a human being acts like a cat and tortures someone and kills them, that's very different, isn't it? Right? Because as humans, we're crowned with glory and honor. We're supposed to be God's rulers. And so it's really different when animals act like animals compared to when people act like animals. So think about this. Good looking man here. King Charles. Suppose uh, a cell phone video emerges of King Charles in some seedy London bar drunk out of his mind, yelling obscenities at whoever comes by. King Charles. Is that front page news the next day? 
You bet. Now, the bars of London are filled with people drunk out of their mind, yelling obscenities at whoever comes near and far. Is that front page news? No. Why? Because King Charles is a king. He has a high calling, a high expectation on his life to act like a king. And when he doesn't act like that, um, that would be a tragic thing. Because we would all say, you're supposed to be better than that. You're the king of England. You're not supposed to act like that. When the others do it, we say, that's fine. You've been in that bar for 30 years doing that, and it's not a big deal because we don't expect them to act any differently. One wears a crown, and one doesn't. We expect the one with, who's wearing the crown to act like a king. So we come back to Psalm 8, and we realize we're wearing crowns. The humans have been crowned with glory and honor. You've made them rulers. So when we think about the king of England and how he should act because he's the king of this tiny little island nation, we are kings and queens of all creation. This is how God has made it. He's crowned us. He's made us rulers. Now, there might be some, some thought in our head right now that says, wait a minute, I thought God was the king, or I thought Jesus was king. Yes, 100%, Jesus is king. God is king. It is never that we're taking that role at all. But he is king, and he has made us kings to serve with him, to rule with him. Um, how many of you have read the Chronicles of Narnia? Some. Okay, those of you who haven't, it's a story about these four little children who go through this wardrobe into this magical world called Narnia, and it's a, it's a whole analogy of this world and God and Jesus. And they become kings and queens, the Pe Pevensey children, whatever their names are. Um, they become kings and queens of Narnia, but they're still a king. It's still Aslan the lion. He is still king of everything. So when we talk about our, us as kings, even though that's maybe not normal language for us, it's very biblical language, but it doesn't usurp the king who is above us. So I want to say that for sure. But we rule on his behalf. This is how he has made it, that we would rule over creation. That's what it means to be image bearers. So I'll give you three definitions of what it means to be the image of God, because they are all good, and I had to share them all. The first two are from two good um, Genesis theologians. Uh, so the first is John... Walton. The image of God in Genesis is not a, oh no, sorry, the image is a physical manifestation of divine or royal essence that bears the function of that which it represents. It's a function. It's something that we do. This gives the image bearer the capacity to reflect the attributes of the one represented and to act on his behalf. That's what it means for us to be made in the image of God. We have a function, we have a job to do, we have the capacity to reflect the attributes of the one who we are representing, and we actually act on God's behalf. Almost everything that God does in this world, he does through us. Sometimes he skips us, and he'll do a miracle for somebody just out of the blue. But almost everything God does, he does through his image bearers. So that's what it means to be an image bearer, is to represent God in this world. The next one is very similar uh, from Peter Enns. The image of God in Genesis is not about what makes us human, such as one soul. It is about the lofty role, role, that's a job to do, God has given humankind to be his representative rulers. That's a really good phrase, representative rulers. That is what image means. Nothing more, but nothing less. So to be made in the image of God means God has a job for you. He has a role for you in this world to reflect him to this world. So Tuesday morning, Friday afternoon, Wednesday evening, all week long, our call is to be image bearers wherever we go to represent the ruler who is, who is above us. I'll give you the third one, and then we can give me your thoughts on all this. Um, this one is from uh, John Piper. It's a little longer. He says, I was created like a mirror, a 
And I brought a mirror with me this morning because sometimes visuals are helpful. And a mirror that was supposed to be 45 degrees with the clear reflective side pointing upward so that as God shone on it at the 45 degree angle, it would bounce off and make a 90 degree turn and be reflected out into the world. God to the world. And at the fall, Satan persuaded me that my image is more beautiful than God's image. And so I flipped the mirror over. Now the backside is toward God. It doesn't reflect anything. Instead, the mirror casts a shadow in the shape of itself on the ground. I fell in love with the shadow. That is what happened, and we have been loving ourselves ever since. Isn't that a good picture? This is how we're supposed to live, right? Reflecting this, that whenever someone looks at me, they just see God. And yet I flipped it around and fell in love with myself. Does this resonate? Is this a helpful way of thinking of the image? Anything else you can add to this? Yeah. That's interesting. So just if you were watching online, Jared was just noticing that light is a dynamic. Light, light moves. Actually, if you get into the science of it, right? Like light is a moving thing, photons and whatever it is. It actually does something. Just like being made in the image of God is to do something. And darkness isn't doing anything. Darkness is just, it's just nothing, right? And so... Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great picture. I like that. I think the one, the one takeaway is that to be made in the image of God is not about who you are, it's about what you do. It is, is a dynamic role. It's, it's a way that we function in this world is to function as the image. Yeah, Scott. Mm. Yeah, the same analogy. We, we, we are a mirror, um, but we are a broken mirror. And I won't break this to fulfill the analogy because my wife will be mad. Um, but yeah, we don't do it perfectly. We don't do it perfectly. Um, I'll skip to the end of my notes. There is one who does. There is one who does. When we think about what it means to reflect God's image, to, to function as God's representative ruler... Jesus does it perfectly, right? And we've talked about this. When you look at Jesus, you are looking at God. No cracks in the mirror at all. Um, yeah, so we do it brokenly, but there is, we can, we can fix the mirror, I guess, right? We're, we're cracked, but as we become more like Jesus, more like God, those cracks heal, I guess, would be the analogy, and there's less cracks. And the more people look at us, the, more, the better picture they get of what God is like. We've got analogies galore here. But that's, that works, right? Jesus did that all the time. All right. Ah. Yeah. And I think, like, you know, we come out of this Sunday school and we're like, yeah, I'm going to be a reflector. And by 3 o'clock, we've already turned it around. Of like, and then we notice it, and we're like, okay, yeah, i got to do this. And I think it's just continual repentance, right, of like we catch ourselves on Wednesday afternoon, and it's like, oh, I'm just staring at myself again. I'm just thinking about Jeff's kingdom and Jeff's everything, right? It's like, turn it around, turn it around. So maybe you'll think of that every time you look in your rearview mirror this week. Let that be a reminder, or any mirror. Maybe if I put that in our heads, we'll think about it, right? Every time you look in a mirror this week, um, let it remind you that that's your job, is to be God's representative ruler. Okay, 
So we're going to move a little bit, we're going to stay on the topic of image of God, but we're going to move away from the Genesis passage um, into an Exodus passage. Uh, and this is very connected, um, and it's the Ten Commandments. And so we come to the third of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. Um, you shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So, um, what do I have here? I don't remember what my notes say. There we go. Um, so the Hebrew word for to take um, is nasha, which is to carry or to bear. It's the same word that you would use of Walt when he brought in the communion trays this morning. He nashad that stuff in here. He carried it. Simple word, okay? Um, so this verse, this third of the Ten Commandments, um, doesn't make any sense on its own. You have to supply something for it to make sense. So I can carry a pen. I can carry a mirror. How do I carry a name? I can't carry a name. And so you have to add something to this verse, no matter how you interpret it, in order for it to make some sense. So historically, what we have added to this verse um, is take the name of the Lord on your lips, which is, a, which is a way that we can use that word nasha, is to take it on your lips. And so we say, you can't say the Lord's name in vain. You can't say, oh my God, in a not worshipful way, right? Um, all those swear words with God's name in it. Uh, you can't say Jesus Christ if you hit your thumb with a hammer. That's traditionally been the way that we've understood this third commandment because it doesn't make sense on its own, so we have to add something to try to figure out what did God mean when he said this to Moses. That may be what it means, um, I've been convinced otherwise in the last few years. We still keep God, we still don't swear, we still don't say God's name uh, in vain, the way we would from this verse, but not based on the Ten Commandments. I would say we would do it on lots of scripture that talks about keeping God's name holy. You think of the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father who art in heaven, what's the very next line? Hallowed be your name, or your name be made holy. So if God's name is holy, I probably don't say, oh God, when I stub my toe. I want to keep his name holy. So there's still lots of space to say we don't talk like that. We don't use God's name flippantly. Again, that might be what this verse means, um, but there's another explanation that I feel is more compelling, that based on the rest of Exodus makes a little bit more sense, and I'll throw it out um, to you here this morning, because it has to do with being an, being an image bearer. Um, so this word, so if we would, um, we could easily translate this third commandment, you shall not bear the name of the Lord, or carry the name of the Lord, um, and so on. So if we look a, a few verses, or a few chapters later in the book of Exodus, we find the same language about bearing a name. And I think it's a clue to help us understand the, the third commandment. And so it comes in Exodus 28. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breastpiece, breastpiece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. So that's the same language, bear names. And it's only a few chapters um, away from the third commandment. And so what it means there, um, and so this is the description of the priest, and so and it's kind of hard to see there, but uh, I think I have a, yeah. So these are 12 stones that the priest wore on his breast piece of judgment, and on each one, you can't really see it, but there's a little bit of Hebrew writing there, and that's the names of the sons of Israel. And so he carries the names, he bears the names, he represents the sons of Israel to God. So that's what it means in that context. To bear the name is to represent those people to God. Um, and so there's a, there's a good understanding that the third commandment means when we bear the name, it's, us, it's not actually about what we say, but about how we represent God to the world. Like having the name on the side of your truck or the name on your jersey or whatever. 
one more piece, a little bit further down from that. Did I say that clear enough? Does that make sense to bear the name? I, I, I bear the name of God to the world, and I shouldn't do that in, in, uh, in vain or do that lightly. I'll give you one more piece. It'll help it make a little bit more sense. Um, also in Exodus 28, and this is also about the priest. You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holy to Yahweh. And you shall fasten it on the turban by a cord of blue. It shall be on the front of the turban. It shall be on Aaron's forehead. So this is another picture of what the priest, um, how he bears the name of God. Uh, There we go. And so this is another little representation. It says, Kadosh le Yahweh, which means holy to Yahweh. And so he bears the name of God on his forehead. And so he represents on his chest, he's got the names of Israel, he represents them to God, and on his head he has Yahweh's name, and he represents Yahweh to the people. So foreheads um, in Scripture are the place of allegiance. It's where you show who you belong to. Um, We do this in different ways in our culture. Um, We will do it sometimes on your arm. You might have an armband like the Red Cross, you have that, that means I belong to the Red Cross. Sometimes we wear them on our chests, and it says, I belong to the Winnipeg Jets. And sometimes we wear them on our foreheads. I belong to John Deere, whatever it is. But we have these ways of representing our allegiances. This is who I belong to, okay? And we have um, something, the, the forehead is important in Scripture. I didn't really realize this until the last couple weeks and I started like digging, I just searched the word forehead um, in Scripture. So you go back to Exodus uh, 13, so a little bit, seven chapters before the Ten Commandments, um, and we read this. Uh, and it will be like a sign, this is about talking about the Passover, on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. So that's why we see Jewish men today, they have these little leather square boxes on their forehead, They're following Exodus 13. And inside that little leather box are scriptures, including Exodus 13, 16. Um, And so they they take the Bible literally, and they wear the the words of God on their forehead. It's a mark of allegiance, saying, this is who I belong to. And when you see this man walking down the street, you know who he belongs to. You know where his allegiance lies. Um, We go to Ezekiel. And so in, in Ezekiel, um, it's, Ezekiel has this, this vision, and this heavenly uh, figure takes him on a tour of the temple, and he sees idol worshipers. All these people, they've actually literally turned their back on the temple, and they're worshiping the sun. They're worshiping all these idols, and there's going to be judgment coming. And so this heavenly being speaks to another heavenly being in Ezekiel, and he says, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. So those people who are mad about the idol worship, God's people, put a mark on their forehead. And then he says, slaughter the old men, the young men and women, the, wi- the mothers and children, but do not touch anyone who has the mark. And so there in Ezekiel, we see God's people, the ones who are not worshiping idols, they have a mark on their forehead. The one that, we're, that we think of easily as we go to Revelation, Right? And we read in Revelation um, about the beast and how it forced all the people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, just like Exodus, right? On your hand or on your forehead. And so those who worship the beast, it's not a microchip on your forehead. It's a spiritual mark on your forehead that you, your allegiance belongs to the beast, to the devil. When we see um, the great prostitute in Revelation 17, The name is written on her forehead, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. So we've seen God's people with marks on their forehead. Satan's people have a mark on their forehead. Also in Revelation, uh, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of God. In Revelation 22, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. So to be one of God's people is to have a mark on your forehead. Everyone in this room, everyone in this town, everyone in this world has a mark on their forehead. They have the mark of the beast or they have the mark of God. 
on our forehead, who we belong to. We can't see it, but it's there. And so as we think about what it means to be uh, made in the image of God, it's, we're like that priest. We've got that thing on our forehead that says, holy to Yahweh. And so for us to represent God well is our, is our task. That's our role. We've, we're marked as his people. Well, whoever we interact with, we are representing God in this world. So it causes me uh, to want to be very careful, at least when I'm thinking about this, about how I live in this world. Because I, as an image bearer, as someone marked on the forehead, I represent him everywhere I go. Um, what did I have there? You will be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. So it's not just the priest who has the gold thing on his forehead that says holy to Yahweh, but each and every one of us does. Are we tracking? Yeah. You can change your forehead. You can change, you can change your allegiance. You can, cha- you can take off your John Deere hat and put on a red one or a yellow one. Or I won't offend anybody. Or I'll offend everybody. But yeah, you're right. Those, those marks are not permanent until they are. I'll give you two more quick thoughts. Um, where did that go? The difference between being made in the image of God and being God. Again, we we are his representative rulers. We are crowned, yes, but there is a king above us. Um, We cannot confuse it that we might be God. This is what happened uh, in the Garden of Eden. The serpent said to the woman, You will not certainly die, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. But what we know from reading Genesis is that she's already like God. (laughs) She's already been made in the image of God. And so what the devil is tempting her with is something that she already has. And rather, what he's tempting her with is, you don't have to have anybody above you. You can be the ruler. You can discern good and evil for yourself. And she eats the apple, and so does Adam. And they say, we would actually like to be God ourselves. And only one chapter later, um, as human beings start to take the role of God rather than being made in the image of God, they start to decide for themselves what is good and evil. So you see Lamech celebrating murder in Genesis 4. Um, He's decided what's good and what's evil. He said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words, and here's his boasting. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. That's his boast. This guy punched me in the face and I killed him. He's redefined good and evil for himself because he's also eaten from the tree and said he will be God. So when we claim the role of God, we can celebrate evil. That's why we celebrate abortion. That's why we celebrate maid. That's why we celebrate all these things where we have become gods and said we will decide what is good and evil. So there's a big difference between being made in in the image of God and eating from the tree and claiming to be God ourselves. This floods into every area of our lives. Um, And I mentioned this already, but yeah, Jesus as the true image of God. I'll close on on this. Um, For us to be image bearers is to become like Jesus. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Uh, Hebrews talks about him as being the exact imprint of God's nature. Um, If we want to be image bearers, if we want to reflect God to this world, we simply need to try to be like Jesus. Because Jesus did it perfectly. And so we can simplify this whole complex thing by saying, just try to be like Jesus. The more we are like Jesus, the more we reflect God to this world. So we've got a few minutes if you have any closing thoughts or comments or questions on this topic. And if not, we'll just chew on it, and that's good. It's a tall order. 
It's way easier to be God ourselves and just decide what's good and evil, but to submit to him and then to do our best to reflect him, it is a tall order. That is why we need the Holy Spirit. That's why it is only through the Spirit that we could ever come anywhere close uh, to being a, a mirror with as few cracks as possible to actually reflect him. So, yeah, that has to be our prayer. Yeah, Les. Oh, yes. Yeah, he is, Jesus is king of kings. If we are kings, he is the king of us, and he is kings of every other king of England and king of whoever else. Yeah, that's good. King of kings and Lord of lords. Glory, hallelujah. Some of you were thinking it. Okay, we'll wrap that up. Uh, Next Sunday, we'll just spend some time um, praying with each other and sharing a little bit of our lives, and then we're going to pick up a series Um, a two-week series after that, uh, talking about worship in the church. So that's what's coming down the pipe for the next few weeks for Adult Sunday School. So we'll leave it there. Thank you.